Welcome everyone to our webinar on preparing your business for the end of financial year. My name is Helen and I'm a practice leader in Legal Vision's TAS team. I'm joined today by my colleague Jack Chi, who is an accountant at William Buck. Jack, can you share a bit of um, background and expertise on what you're doing in William Buck? Thanks, Helen. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to have you join us. Um, I'm a director at William Buck. Um, we're an accounting firm based in the Sydney CBD. Uh, we work a lot of SME businesses, uh, in particular tech. Uh, so, yeah, uh, nice to have you and look forward to um, uh, giving, sharing some uh, great knowledge. Great. Thanks, Jack. Um, now, before we begin, um, a couple of um, house, quick housekeeping items that we just need to um, talk about. So you will be emailed the webinar recording and slides. Um, submit your questions in the chat box after the webinar and please complete the survey after the webinar. Also, all attendees are eligible to receive a free consultation with us to discuss how we can help with your contracts or any of your legal needs. Uh, to please request a free consultation and provide us with your contact details and the survey that appears at the end of this webinar. So today we will be discussing um, tax planning before the end of the financial year, R&D tax incentives, maximising and minimising, or maximising your tax incentives um, and also minimising those risks, um, other types of pre-30 June tax planning action items that Jack will also cover. Uh, we'll go through some structuring uh, key points and some ESIC matters and ESOPs importance of documentation, year-end reporting, and also how the 2023 federal budget will affect you. Um, so at the end of the webinar, we'll be answering some of your questions. Please submit these questions throughout the webinar, throughout the, in the chat function that appears, and we will answer them at the end. Now, Jack will um, have a chat to us about the tax planning and why this is important before 30 June. Thanks, Jack. Okay. All right, thanks, Alan. So um, uh, I want to talk about uh, what, what is tax planning, right? So tax planning is legitimately um, optimising your tax position uh, by undertaking act action items uh, as early as possible and certainly before uh, 30 of June, the, the year end, okay? So the today, um, today's focus is on startups and scale-ups, uh, tech companies, but also we'll talk um, briefly on uh, non-tech uh, SME businesses as well, okay? And so, so, so um, uh, we, we, much of the uh, content is about what you need to do before 30 of June, okay? So on the next slide, uh, we're talking about uh, the single biggest tax issue uh, for a lot of uh, tech startups and scale-ups, which is the R&D tax incentive, okay? So, um, why is tax planning relevant to the R&D tax incentive? Well, the R&D tax incentive is part of the tax system, so which means that what affects tax tends to affect the R&D incentive, okay? So, and also startups and scale-ups with sufficient revenue, uh, they will actually start to see tax liabilities starting to eat into their R&D refund. And without going into too much detail, because of the way R&D tax incentive works, um, any uh, R&D expenditure that is claimed is treated as non-deductible. So it's actually possible to get a tax liability even though the company itself is making losses. So basically it's absolutely um, in the um, startup's favour to uh, legitimately reduce tax liabilities. Okay. Um, uh, next slide. So we'll, we'll first talk about how to maximise uh, your R&D tax incentive. Uh, the things you need to do before 30 of June. So um, here's a list, okay? So the uh, first one is early identification of what are your core and supporting R&D activities, okay? And attribute all costs to those activities. Why, why is this the case? Why is it relevant? It's because the earlier you identify what are your eligible R&D uh, activities, the better position you are to keep the necessary documents uh, and records uh, to support your claim and therefore claim these expenses with confidence, which ends up with a bigger claim and a safer claim, uh, uh, generally speaking, okay? So um, uh, another thing you could do is um, if the startup has R&D expenses incurred to related entities, um, associates, um, those payments need to be made through the bank. Just some um, shuffling of paper 
uh, through some invoices, but no payment being made may not be enough. It may result in uh, those expenses not being claimable. Okay. Uh, another thing to do is solve items within any legal entity um, uh, structure and ownership issues as early as possible. Okay. And we, we see that often. Uh, you may have a single entity structure, which um, is uh, quite simple, but uh, sometimes it's group structures and related entities. Uh, whenever there is a group structure involved, you need to start thinking about, do you form a tax consolidated group? Is the right entity making the expenses? Uh, is the R&D claim registered under the right entity? Okay, so we see mistakes being made all the time. Um, and finally, if you have expenditure overseas that you want to claim uh, R&D for, you need an overseas finding from Aussie industry. And that finding is a process that takes time and needs to be made before 30th of June. Okay, so next slide. Um, we're talking about how to uh, minimize ATO and OS industry review risk. Now, where is the landscape currently at? Uh, there was a hiatus of uh, review and audit activity during COVID. Uh, and now that uh, things are returning to a new normal, um, we're definitely seeing review activities are ramping up again. Is it the same level as um, the uh, amount of audits happening? during 2018, 2019, no, but certainly review activities are increasing. Uh, and to reduce the ATO and OS industry risk on the R&D claim, you, it's very much the number one uh, thing you can do is uh, improving your documentation. Because in the event of a review, they're not as interested in talking to you as um, asking for documents, okay? Um, and there is a separate discussion later today on uh, documentation, um, but it's very much about getting documentation in place before 30 June and integrated uh, the R&D claim process with your existing uh, uh, admin and software development or other development processes. Okay, um, and once again, uh, to re 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 uh, reduce the risk of reviews and audits, don't claim under the wrong entity. Um, and in, uh, once again, this is mainly an issue where there is a group structure involved, okay? Um, next slide. Other pre-30 June tax planning action items. So now this goes back to what I was saying about uh, it's in a uh, company's interest to uh, reduce its tax liability, even if uh, it's in a loss making mode, uh, if it's making R&D claims. And these action items are relevant for non-tech companies as well. So I would call these traditional tax planning measures, okay? So just, I'll go through uh, the list. Um, so pay any unpaid um, super for the year. So if you were gonna pay super annuation on empl for employees uh, in uh, July, you might as well pay it a, a few weeks earlier because unpaid super is not deductible for tax purposes. Uh, another thing is write off back debt. So if you have back debt, you're not expecting to collect it, write it off and document it as such that you've written it off and then it's uh, tax deductible. If you have supply invoices that you know are coming and you could land on either side of 30 June, maybe get it before 30 June, okay? Because um, you know, th that's one year's worth of difference in terms of when you can claim that. Um, if you have large invoices to clients, uh, to your clients, uh, uh, definitely look into the concept of unearned income because um, if you have a large chunks of income but you haven't done what's absolutely necessary for you to earn that income, for that income to come home, uh, then it may be arguable that, that some of that uh, income is actually not accessible in the current financial year. Okay, so this is uh, definitely something that is um, that can make a very big difference to taxable income, especially for uh, long-term uh, large projects. Okay, um, another thing you can do is purchase capital items such as computer equipment, but you know any capital item that's not a building uh, is potentially um, subject to the instant asset write-off, which is uh, very um, useful. Um, the other tips, they're not really tax planning as such, but it's still um, relevant, which is reconcile and regularly update your accounts. So um, the, the, the clients we work with, the, the ones that are able to um, make the best um, decisions and take the best action items, they tend to reconcile their accounts 
fairly regularly. They don't leave it till uh, the end to reconcile months and months of transactions. Okay. And the last point um, on this slide is uh, issue employee share options before expiry at the startup concession eligibility. Once again, this doesn't affect the tax liability of uh, the company as such, uh, because uh, employee share schemes are tax issues for the employees. But this is still sort of relevant in the same flavor of things, in the sense that we're starting to see more and more companies becoming um, too old or simply um, uh, have too much revenue to be eligible for the startup concession. And it may be that this is the last year that um, uh, it's eligible. So uh, maybe make some issues uh, if, if that is the case. Okay. All right, next slide. So, um, so the, 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 this slide is more on the non-tech companies. Okay, so um, uh, for, for companies that are potentially making a profit. So make the trust distributions of family trusts um, uh, and document as such uh, for any income coming out of these businesses, uh, dividends. Uh, so the ATO requires the, the trustees of family trusts to uh, distribute income, uh, otherwise it's top, uh, taxed at the top marginal tax rate, uh, and document it as such. This, this is definitely a pre-30 June tax planning item uh, that you have to do. Um, another one is repay Division 7A for other company loans, okay, and uh, unpaid present entitlements. And um, uh, pay out dividends uh, to potentially uh, uh, repay some of these loans, but that's subject to fracking credit availability, okay. Um, all right, next slide is structures and uh, restructuring. So, um, uh, Helen? Thanks, Jack. Um, now, as Jack mentioned um, earlier, it is important to start thinking about structures, um, particularly if you are um, wanting to access the R&D tax offsets and making those claims. Um, as he correctly mentioned, we, we see a lot of um, scenarios where clients don't realise which entities should be claiming the R&D or they're not understanding, particularly when they have a group structure. Um, as, as Jack mentioned, having a single entity is very straightforward. Um, there's only one entity involved that's holding the end product, that's claiming the R&D. There's, when the client, we see clients that are in a dual company structure, you know, where, which involves a holding company and an operating company. When you have multiple entities involved, it can be confusing. And we see mistakes happening, as Jack mentioned where clients are unsure as to which entity should be claiming, which entity should be holding the um, R&D, and then what type of documentation should be in place. Um, having these conversations now is really important um, and understanding which entity is doing what. Um, these types of scenarios or circumstances also arise where clients are also um, have investors that are claiming the early stage innovative company concession, where investors are investing and wanting to take advantage of the various tax advantages and having um, investing in, in ESIC, which is an early stage innovative company. Um, if you have, um, so, so the dual company, so if we have, we see a lot of clients that have multiple companies, a dual company, a holding company, an operating company, and the same mistakes happen, their clients are not sure which entity should be the one that's actually the innovative company, which one is the one that should be into, um, issuing the shares, and it can be confusing. Um, it's important to start understanding the structure you're in and ensuring the correct documentations are in place for the two companies, um, or multiple companies if you have more than two. Um, no, it's If you have um, investors that have already invested this financial year, then you may be getting questions from investors asking whether the company is an ESIC and asking for evidence and documents it's important you start having these conversations with um, your advisors now, um, particularly, I mean, it's not so important as a 30 June um, deadline. The timing in regards to ESIC is more about um, immediately after when the shares are issued, whether those shares are ESIC shares. So it's still important to be having these conversations now if your investors are thinking about lodging their returns um, on the basis that they are um, being issued ESIC shares. Now, if you have investors that are investing next year, you may be wanting to think about um, whether your company now is ESIC ready. There are a couple of relevant qualifications 
um, which you should start thinking about, um, and that is the income of the ESIC company and its subsidiaries is less than $200,000 for the financial year, the prior financial year. So this financial year, if they're thinking about investing next year, um, S, uh, expenditure should be under $1 million for the ESIC company and its subsidiaries. So these are things that you can plan for and think about if you have investors that are interested for the next financial year. Um, other reasons why you may be thinking about having these conversations or structuring conversations with your advisors now is um, ESOPs, as Jack mentioned, if you're coming to an end of your startup concession, then you need to be um, either issuing those options or shares now so your employees can take advantage of the startup concessions before it ends. Um, the, the end time is 10 years. So if you're ending and you're getting too old and you're no longer, um, I guess, in a startup, then you need to be having those conversations with your advisors now about alternatives, um, alternative um, employee share schemes that you can start thinking about for the next financial year. Um, other reasons may be you may be thinking about getting into a more tax effective structure before 30 June. Um, as Jack mentioned, if you're a non-tech company, you may have trust dis or distributions to be made. You may want to, um, put in place a trust entity now to distribute income. Um, those are things you should be talking to your accountants about, thinking about in advance before the year ends. We can't put in place a trust in the new financial year for distributions for this year. So having those structures in place before 30 June is really important. Um, you may also be thinking about tidying up your business or your structure because it's not you know, in the entity that you want to be trading in in the new financial year, um, you may have loans or other transactions that are just undocumented or um, a bit messy and you just want to clean it up. You may want to do that now and then have a fresh clean structure ready for the new year. Um, these are things that you should be thinking about and talking with your advisors before the end of, um, or before 30 June. Um, if you're thinking about spending or, um, you know, restructuring for other reasons or spending for growth, moving overseas, then you may want to um, do this in this year if you're loss making or pre-revenue, um, it may be a better tax outcome if you do it now versus next financial year where you're uh, making revenue and you're actually trading. Um, other reasons is if you're thinking about consolidating, so as Jack mentioned, if you're have a two company structure, you may want to be consolidating for R&D purposes. Um, you would need to make those elections um, now and start having those conversations with your accountant. Now, as these conversations are really important to start thinking about and having with your advisors now because restructuring takes time, planning takes time. We are nearing the end of financial year. I think there's about six weeks left. So if you're if you're already considering it and thinking about it, you need to be having these conversations to at least get the ball rolling. Um, putting documentations in place takes time as well, which does lead me to the next slide, um, which we're talking about documentation. So we did want to focus on um, contemporaneous documentation. Now, what does that mean and why is it important? Um, contemporaneous document means that documents that are prepared now, um, before, the transaction takes place and not after the fact. It's important that you have documentation that evidence is something that's hap happening or it's um, about to happen. So if you're signing a document after something has already happened, then it may not be viewed as um, evidence that the ATO would consider to be relevant or um, you know, actual contemporaneous document to evidence something's actually happened. Um, there are risk in putting in place a data ratification, which is basically a legal document which says that you ratify something that has already happened, but if you have no evidence of that transaction happening, then there are risks in that that document is not valid. Um, the, if there are related party transactions between directors or the company or shareholders and company, uh, or even between shareholders, and none of them are documented, um, these types of arrangements can be scrutinized by the ATO. Now, Jack's gonna go through some um, focus points of what the ATO is looking at at the moment in regards to documentation. Thanks, Jack. Cool. Thanks, Alan. 
Um, so look, we've broken down to um, uh, a few main um, buckets. So the ATO focus areas, as far as R&D tax incentive is concerned, right, uh, is um, the number one they ask for is timesheets. Now, so let me uh, clarify what, why is there both ATO and Aussie industry? So the R&D tax incentive program is administered by uh, these two government bodies. The Aussie industry is focused on the science and experimentation and technical unknowns aspect of the R&D claim, whereas ATO is very much focused on expenditure okay, and related party transactions and structure. So when ATO comes into the, the frame in the event of a review audit, um, the number one thing they are guaranteed to ask for is employee timesheets. Now, uh, accountants and lawyers, uh, we're very much across what timesheets are, but how across timesheets is an SME business, right? So the answer is um, nobody likes timesheets, and yet it's the probably one of the single uh, uh, top things that the ATO asks for in the uh, event of a review of R&D tax incentive. So just think of as my advice to people is just think of as something that you need to do in order to get a good chunk of money uh, under the R&D tax incentive. Okay, so it doesn't have to be extremely onerous. It doesn't have to be come in the form of a uh, you know um, complicated uh, spreadsheet. Um, it could be just any form of document that records on a, on a contemporaneous basis how much did the employees uh, spend their time on various R&D projects. Okay, so uh, it could be a, a project management um, workflow uh, chart or spreadsheet. Uh, it could be just an employee timesheet template that your accountant or R&D advisor has provided you, um, provided you record the time spent on employees on um, different things uh, each day, each week. Um, each day is gold standard, um, but certainly each week is a lot better than nothing. Provided it records that, that info, you put yourself in a really good position in, uh, in the event of a ATO review. Uh, the other things are contractor agreements. Okay, so um, when you have agreements with contractors, uh, developers, so make sure um, uh, they refer to a lot of the key words from the R&D tax incentive, okay? And make sure the invoices talk about that too. Otherwise, ATO will say, I can see a bunch of in uh, invoices and costs. How do I know that connects with what you're saying is an R&D claim? Um, related party transactions is absolutely an area of uh, ATO focus when it comes to documentation. Um, the temptation whenever there is a uh, bunch of related parties dealing with each other is, uh, you know, they're all owned by the same group or uh, even if they're not, there's a huge amount of trust there. They don't document things that, as they would with the unrelated party. Uh, and then, uh, which is all fine until ATO comes in and starts asking for, uh, for documentation. Uh, and the reason ATO wants to see is because um, it inherently, you know, suspects uh, that uh, something is afoot with a lot of related party transactions, which is why you absolutely want to document this clearly. Is there some kind of development agreement, the loan agreements, who owns IP, okay? And so they're very much uh, things that um, uh, the ATO would uh, focus on and your lawyer uh, uh, can definitely provide you with uh, these uh, documents, okay? So speak to legal vision on that. Um, Oz industry focus areas, they're very much focused on the experimentation process. They want to understand who, what kind of experts you've spoken to, um, uh, to ascertain what's the, the current state of knowledge. They want to understand what's, what kind of failures and technical uh, uncertainties you ran into. And they want to see records of your experimentation process. Once again, there's a bit of a challenge. Um, associated with this for a lot of R&D incentive claims, especially in the software R&D claims, because the agile software methodology is very much about, uh, you know, not having extensive documentation. Uh, so um, this, once again, is something that, you know, you've got to see as a little bit of extra work you've got to do to, to, to get the R&D uh, incentive, okay? Um, so it doesn't have to be extremely onerous. Uh, definitely, um, we have tips and advice to uh, startups and scale-ups on how to 
leverage off their you know existing software um, uh, uh, their, their softwares to record this experimentation process. Okay. Um, now, um, there's some other documentation uh, that I haven't yet mentioned, the R&D project plan. Lots of people were familiar with that. Uh, project management software I've spoken about. Uh, it's, it's, um, with that, it's very much about how to um, uh, tweak your existing processes and documents anyway, um, that are you keeping anyway, uh, in order to um, use it for an additional purpose. Okay. Um, all right, next slide. So I'm going to take this opportunity to very briefly talk about year-end tax reporting, okay? So this isn't tax planning as per se, but um, this does fall into the similar time of the year and it does have tax implications. Okay? So impl um, employee share schemes. So if the company has provided employee share scheme options, shares. Uh, the report is due to the ATO by 14th of August and the uh, a ESS statement is due to employees by 14th of July. Okay, this is something I see people uh, forget very regularly. Okay, and the problem comes about when uh, employees lodge their returns uh, and ATO data matching says, well, we don't have record of this, what's going on? Okay. Um, uh, ESIC uh, early stage innovation company tax incentives. Helen has uh, discussed some of the key technical requirements around that, uh, some of the tax planning items. Um, this there is a report that is due to the ATO by 31st of July, and once again, data matching will catch people out if investors go, okay, I'm going to lodge my tax return now. I'm going to claim this 20% tax offset up to $200,000. Uh, there you go, ATO. Uh, here's my return. ATO looks at it and goes, I don't have corresponding data. Okay, so that's something that you, you want to avoid and uh, very much get this reporting in. And finally, taxable payments annual reporting. Okay, so this covers uh, operators in various industries, including construction and uh, in recent years, uh, software. Okay, this is really widely defined. So um, there is a very good chance. Uh, tech startups and scale-ups are caught in the taxable payments annual reporting uh, scheme uh, simply because they are developing software. Okay, so ATO has given um, many uh, categories that it considers as relevant, and it's going to be you know quite hard for a lot of startups and scale-ups to to not get caught by that. So you need to report to the ATO for transactions payments that you've made. Okay, um, uh, you know, according to certain categories, and luckily, um, software accounting software such as Zero uh, are quite good at uh, minimising the, the compliance burden on that. So this is due by the twenty eighth of August. All right, next slide, please. So um, uh, once another small item we'll tack onto the discussions today, which is related to tax planning, is the uh, twenty twenty three federal budget. Now I'm sure a lot of you have already. Um, uh, read and you know uh, watch lots of things to do with the federal budget. So I'll just keep this very very brief. Um, so because there are certainly um, tax planning um, items in there, is it um, massively game changing things uh, across the whole economy? No, the government has a massive monetary uh, hole to plug. So you know you don't go into this budget with a lot of expectations. But there's still good opportunities in there. For example. Uh, in the good things bucket, I will put the industry growth program, which replaces the accelerating commercialization grant. Okay, so um, uh, a lot of founders will be familiar with this particular grant, the industry uh, growth, uh, the accelerating commercialization program. Now, this new thing called industry growth program replaces that. It has a similar flavor, although the amounts are different, the processes aren't exactly the same. So keep an eye out for this industry growth program. Um, there's investment into critical uh, technologies industries being quantum computing and artificial intelligence. Okay, so if you're a company in those two areas, certainly look into this one when more details are released. Now, the, the not so good um, news bucket is things like uh, the canning of the, the cancellation of the paper box uh, measures, which uh, um, is really effective uh, would have been really effective for attracting foreign investment in Australia uh, in medical uh, technologies and biotech. 
Um, another not so great news is Export Market Development Grant. The amount has been cut again. Now, it's almost getting to the point where uh, a lot of SME business is going, well, we would love to receive some of this Export Market Development Grant, but the amount we receive is so small, is it worth it? Uh, now, that's going to be even more of a um, relevant question for people. Uh, digital Games uh, Tax Offset, it was announced by the Morrison government. Um, Labor said they were going to uh, uh, try to proceed with it. The bill was introduced to Parliament and haven't heard really much about it since. Uh, budget doesn't talk about it. I guess it's uh, not cancelled, but you know it's 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 in limbo at the moment, and time's running out to implement that. Um, now there's some sort of so-so measures. For example, extending the instant asset write-off. It was due to be um, uh, expired uh, come 30 June this year. Uh, there's an extension of that with a uh, limit on the um, instant uh, on the asset uh, to twenty thousand dollars. Okay, um, so so this is uh, this will apply from one July 23 to 30 June 2024. It's a slight extension, um, and there is the small business energy incentive, which gives a 20% extra deduction for uh, businesses going um, uh, electrifying and improving their energy efficiency. Okay, so that's a very, very quick overview of some of the um, federal budget opportunities. Okay, all right. Um, thanks for that, Jack. I um, appreciate everything you've um, gone through. Um, now, right. as we're in, Yep, great, thanks. Um, now, as we're ending, um, getting to the end of our webinar, um, I just wanted to um, just note here, you'll see on the slide that you can download um, in the handout section in the webinar, um, an end of financial year checklist, which may be helpful. Um, in the next slide, um, thank you. Um, we also have an upcoming event that may be of interest to you. Um, which is Deal Structures 101, Understanding Equity, Safe and Convertible Notes, uh, which is on Thursday the 18th, 11 a.m. Um, please register at Legal Vision um, below it. That link down you can see on the web um, slide. Um, on the next slide, now we're just going to answer some of your questions shortly. Um, while you submit them, we'll take um, some time to tell you about our membership. Um, now, Legal Vision's membership is a cost-effective alternative to the expensive hourly rates you experience with other firms. For an affordable monthly fee, you can receive cost certainty and an all-inclusive uh, legal service, including unlimited document review, including drafting, amending and reviewing, business contracts and commercial leases. It includes unlimited advice consultations with our team of 100 plus specialist lawyers, including business structuring, employment disputes and more. Uh, we also have unlimited domestic trademark registration. As a Legal Vision member, you won't worry about the cost of lawyers ever again. Think of it as having your own in-house counsel. We'll take care of all the business as usual legal work so you can focus on running your business. And if you're an in-house counsel, our membership is a cost-effective solution for outsourcing additional legal work. To learn more about how the membership can help you, um, please request a free consultation when the survey appears at the end of this webinar. Um, these consultations are also available if you're interested in um, expanding on any of the things that we've already discussed in this webinar, particularly about structuring um, before the end of financial year. Now, we will answer some of your questions that have been submitted. So let me just have a look through. Um, and also, sorry, just a slide here. Um, if you have any questions, please contact um, anything that um, <clears throat> Jack's gone through today. Please contact him in this below um, details and the slide here. So one of the questions um, that has come up is, what is the maximum ESIC investment for our small business? Um, now, there are a lot of qualifications um, to satisfy if you're an ESIC. If you, the, I think actually Jack mentioned it, the maximum amount is 200,000 is the amount you can offset and or you can, actually I don't I think the question is asking what the maximum amount you can invest. Yeah, um, per if you're a, yeah, yeah, per business. So if you're a sophisticated um, investor and there are a number of things as to whether you qualify as a sophisticated investor, essentially someone that is earning a certain um, amount of money 
um, and someone that's investing a lot of different investments. Um, if they are a sophisticated investor, they can um, invest um, as much as they want really, but they can only get a tax offset of up to 200,000 in an in income year. If you're a non-sophisticated investor, then the maximum amount uh, the investor can invest into a company is 50,000. If you as a non-sophisticated investor invest into um, one company or a number of companies and it's more than 50,000 in one income year, then you cannot access ESIC. So it's really important to actually determine whether your investor is a sophisticated investor or not, because if they're not, then they may lose the opportunity to actually access that concession. Um, so that's an important factor. But yeah. definitely reach out to your advisors if you have any questions about qualification, because you need to satisfy the early, um, early test, um, as well as a 100 points test or a principles-based test. So, um, and those things, there are a number of things to go through. Sorry, Jack, did you have something to add to that? Uh, yeah, thanks, Alan. The, the only thing I'll, I'll add is, uh, so those are the limits per investor, depending on their profile. But from the business standpoint, you can have as many of these investors as you like. There is no actual um, limit from an ESIC standpoint on how many investors uh, that they, you, that you cobble together. Um, the whole purpose of the ESIC scheme is to help people raise capital. Uh, so it definitely wouldn't place a cap on that. So it's really the the, the, the limits are those limits that Helen's uh, mentioned from a uh, per investor's uh, standpoint, if they want to maintain an eligibility for um, uh, the benefits. Thanks, Jack. Um, a question's come up about uh, digital training and SaaS subscriptions. Um, Jack, are you able to answer that one? Um, what was the question? Are we able to claim 20% for digital training and SaaS subscriptions and how does that work? Most of my See, business that's the thing, right? So the last time I looked into that, I don't believe, I'm not 100%, but I don't believe it's been legislated. So it's another um, announcement, I believe, mm. potentially by the old previous uh, federal government, but um, I don't recall for sure, but I don't think it's uh, it's being legislated, and time's kind of running out. So yeah, so there's a few there's a few um, things that have been legislated. Is, if I'm right, it hasn't been leg it hasn't been legislated. Then uh, this measure is a, is in a bit of a limbo. Okay, um, and it's a bit similar to the digital games uh, offset. Just, just double check whether it's, um, I'm, I'm fairly sure it hasn't been legislated yet. So it's just an announcement, that's it. Yeah, I think you're right there, Jay, but we can double check and get back to that person who's asked. Um, <clears throat> another question has come through, um, what is the time limit for the ESOP concessions for startups? Um, so the time limit is 10 years. Um, so the company has to be um, um, no more, there's not older than 10 years old. Um, once the company itself is out of that 10 year um, period, then uh, the startup concessions don't apply. I should also note that there is also another time limit, which is the uh, seven year period for using the safe harbor net tangible asset valuation method. Um, so just keeping in mind, there's a 10 year and also a seven year period if you want to take advantage of the safe harbor methodology. Um, as yeah. well. I mean, this, there is a seven year, but you can also get in if you're a small business as well. So just keep that yeah. in mind. So if you're, if you're between seven and 10, uh, then um, yeah, you're still eligible to start a concession. And it's just that the, for example, if it's uh, share options, then the option exercise price couldn't be as low as the uh, net tangible asset uh, amount, for example. Okay. That's the context. Um, we have another question that's come in. It's um, separating the IP into a holding company but need to do the research with the university through an operating company. How does this impact R&D returns? Um, so this is um, goes back to the question of which entity um, is actually the one that's incurring the expenses, which, one's, which entity is the R&D entity and which is the one that's holding the IP. Um, Jack, did you want to go through this because you do a lot of R&D? Um, yeah. claims where this is relevant and I can talk about the documents. Yeah, yes, sure. So 
Um, uh, th there's a number of things to think about, uh, uh, being that, for example, uh, the R&D claimant needs to be the entity that is going to uh, receive the future economic benefits from uh, whatever it is that is the R&D project. Okay, so if the entity claiming it isn't the future entity that's going to benefit from the um, you know economically, then potentially you have a problem with uh, deductibility and nexus uh, with uh, future uh, income. Okay. Um, uh, but um, uh, that, that's, that's probably one of the main issues. Uh, and once again, if there is a group structure, then make sure the right entity has uh, been claimed. So I won't bother repeating some of the things um, Helen and I mentioned already on the group st structure side of things. So, so just bear that in mind. Um, and we just like to add to that is um, when you have these types of arrangements where you have the dual company, which is what we spoke about in the webinar, um, is just making sure the documentation is in place. So we would um, speak to your lawyer or your tax advisor and talk about um, whether you need to implement a services agreement or contract agreements for um, you know certain people that are doing the work and making sure the payments are made from the holding company to the operating company for the services that they are, uh, the operating entity may be incurring. Um, and then also, um, yeah, sorry, so the documentation and also if you're um, consolidating. So if you're consolidating, it does make this type of structure a bit easier to deal with from an R&D perspective. Yeah, and I think there's a follow-on question, Helen. Can both companies put a claim in, um, not for the same activities, okay? And not for the same expenses. So it may be that there's two separate eligible claimants there. I don't know, depending on the facts. But for the same activities and same expenditure, it makes no sense for um, uh, both, com uh, both companies to put a claim in. You just need to get, you know, pretty basic tax advice, really, right? So uh, look, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to cast my eye over it, uh, just you know, on a general commentary basis. Yeah, so feel free to reach out. Yeah, um, we look. We've had a few questions that are quite um, specific. It seems like to the person or into that business. Um, if these have come through, we might contact you. We'll contact you separately um, to get in touch about your specific questions and your needs. Um, or either um, please contact us if you haven't heard from us and you have specific questions about your business. Then please reach out um, to either Jack or myself, and we can help you through those questions. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. Um, please, as you can see there, there is the um, the free webinar. I'm mean, sorry, the free consultation. Um, sorry, I'm just <laughs> losing my notes. Um, um, so thank you so much. A survey will pop up. Um, we would really appreciate it if you could complete the, the 30 second survey um, and please include your contact details as well to receive a complimentary consultation. Thanks so much for joining us and thanks Jack as well for your time. Thanks all. Thanks Ellen. Have a good day. Okay. See you later. Thank you.